Alrighty, today we're going to be looking at Coulomb's Law. Alright, now in Coulomb's Law, this is what it states. The force between two point charges is directly proportional to the product of their charges, Q1 and Q2, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Okay, now we've already talked about this part right here with the inversely proportional to the square of the distance, right? That means that the farther you get, it's going to get even weaker and weaker and not just a straight up linear relationship. If you go twice as far, it's going to be a quarter as strong as it was before. Okay, so we've talked about that part. Okay, this is actually the equation right here that denotes that, but here's your force, there's the inverse squared relationship. It's also proportional to the product of the charges. Okay, now that's a direct proportion, and so those two are being multiplied. And then there is a constant, which is this k, this 9.0 times 10 to the negative 9th Newton times meter squared over Coulomb squared. Don't worry about that too much. As long as you put the charges in coulombs and the radius in meters, then you're going to get out a force that is newtons. All right. Um, the the other thing that I should probably point out from Coulomb's law is this: this is the force between two point charges. Okay. Now in class we haven't necessarily talked about point charges, but what point charges are is that is where we assume that all of the charge of the particle or the object is all centered in the middle, which means that you can't separate the pluses and the minuses. Okay? Now that'll be important when we start to look at real objects and we realize that we can't always use Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law again only works if they're point charges, if all the charges are centralized in the very center of your object. Just like when we did gravity, we imagine that all of the mass was in the center of the object, right? So Let's go ahead and look at some questions. All right, let's start with this example, conceptual example number two. For each situation, draw force vectors showing all forces exerted on each of the point charges. Okay, go ahead and pause the video, give this one a try yourself, and then restart it up. Okay, so let's look at the first one. We've got two charges, a positive 4 and a positive 2. And so when we're doing these, we want to make sure that since they're both positive, we're going to have repelling forces. And most people are okay with that. But then when you draw the force vectors, make sure that the force vectors have the right length. Okay, so if the force of 2 on 4 is that way, then the force of 4 on 2 is the same length in the other direction. Why are they the same if one's bigger than the other? Well, remember that this force is one on the other because of what the other is. So the two is a smaller charge, but it's pushing on something that has a much larger electric charge. You know, if you do the equation for this up here, it doesn't matter where you put the two and where you put the four, it's going to end up giving you the same force. This is also a manifestation of Newton's third law. If object one exerts an electrostatic force on object 2, then object 2 exerts the same electrostatic force on object 1, just in the opposite direction. Alright, let's go ahead and look at the second one. Hopefully you get it out on your own. Let's start with this guy right here. Okay, so first he's a certain distance away from this one, so he's going to have some type of attraction. Right, a positive and a negative attract. Okay, but we also have to consider what's happening due to this guy way over here. Okay, you can't ignore him just because he's on the other side, just like you can't ignore gravity just because there's a couple of floors in a building between you and the center of, and, and the earth. Okay, so we need to have a positive and a positive are going to repel. Now, how strong is that going to be? Well, the distance is twice as far. And since it is an inverse squared relationship, then that means that the force is going to be 2 inverse is 1 half, squared is 1 quarter, so it's going to be 1 quarter of the length. All right, we go to this guy. This guy here in the middle is going to be attracted to that with the same force that the positive was attracted there, and then also attracted to the other one. All right, and then this outside one will look exactly like this guy, just opposite. He's going to be attracted to the minus, and then repulsed one quarter of the strength from this positive again because he's twice as far. Okay, so hopefully that was kind of a good introduction to Coulomb's law for you. Let's go ahead and look now at example number two. Okay, so a mathematical one. In the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom, the electron is in orbit around the nuclear proton at a radius of 5.29 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. Determine the electrostatic force between the electron and the proton. Well, we know that the force 
is equal to k q1 q2 over r squared. Okay, so k is 9 times 10 to the 9th. If you don't believe me, just rewind. Go look at the k that I just had up there. All right, q1. Okay, now it doesn't matter which one this is, but let's go ahead and do the electron first. Charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Now, I understand that it's a negative. It's a negative electron. But for our purposes, when we do four Coulomb's law, we're going to put just the positive charges down, the absolute value. And then when we get the answer, we're going to get the direction based off of the the attractions and the repulsions, right, based off of the positive and negative charges. The problem is if you put negatives in and you get a negative answer out, the, the general tendency is to think, oh, well, negative is left or negative is down. And that's not always the case, especially when it's going in a circle. Negative could sometimes be to the right, sometimes to the left, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes at some angle. And so it's, it's easier to just put the positive numbers in get the answer, and then work out the direction later. Okay, charge of object number two, the proton. The proton also has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Of course, that one's positive. Okay, divided by the radius squared, so 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11th. We've got to square that one, so let's pull out our calculator and type that in. So we got 9e9 times 1.6 e to the negative 19th times 1.6 e to the negative 19th divided by 5.29 e to the negative 11 squared. All right, so there we go, 8.23 times 10 to the negative 8. And since it's a force, that will be Newtons. So we found the force. What's the direction? Well, the proton is positive. The electron is negative. So if we're looking, we know it's going to be an attraction. So for the electron, the electron is going to be pulled towards the proton. The proton is going to be pulled towards the electron. Okay, now it didn't actually ask that. It's just good for us to think about it and say, okay, what's going to happen here? Okay, so just I just wanted to make sure that you understood that was what, what, what's going on. All right, so now we want to determine the speed of the electron, assume, assuming the orbit to be circular. Okay, just that one word should key you off that we're looking at something dealing with previously this year. So circular motion right, going in a circle. The reason why an object goes in a circle is because you have some type of centripetal force which is always pulling it towards the center. Now in this case that centripetal force is the electrostatic force. That's exactly right. The force of the proton pulling the electron in. The electron otherwise would just keep going straight, right? That's Newton's first law. The reason why it turns is because the proton is pulling towards the center on it. And so the force of a a centripetal force is mv squared over r, and then the electrostatic force is what we just solved, 8.23 times 10 to the negative eighth. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this on the other side because I'm running out of a little bit of space. The mass, now that's the mass of the object that's orbiting, so that's an electron. Mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. All right and then multiplied by the velocity squared. Um, that's what we're looking for, right? Divided by the radius, so 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11th, and of course that's equal to 8.23. So let's pull out our calculator. So first we'll take our 8.23 times 10 to the negative 8th. We'll multiply by 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11th. Then we will, so now this is up there, so now we need to divide by the 9.11 times e to the negative 31st. And then we'll let, we're left with v squared, so we'll take the square root. And we get, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2.19 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. It's pretty fast. Of course, when you're thinking about the speed of light, it's still only about a it's about a hundred times smaller, right? So fast, but uh, 
not quite so fast. <laughs> All right, so there we go. All right, let's go on and look at another one. Now, let's do a conceptual thing. All right, go ahead and read this. Wait a second. If an object is neutral, then the charge is zero for that object, right? That means there should be no force on the object. However, in class, when we took a neutral object, right, and we hung it from the ceiling, and we took a positively charged rod or a negatively charged rod next to it, there was attraction, right? Do you remember that? We had a neutral object. We did it with the 2x4, right? In class, I showed you the video, but the 2x4 was attracted. There was clearly a force on a neutral object. So does that mean that Coulomb's law doesn't work? Of course not. If you remember, when we stated Coulomb's law, we said it only works for a point charge. And a point charge means that all of the charge is in the center of your object. The reason why this works is because when you have a real object, right, the positives are going to go to one side and the negatives are going to go to the other, which means they aren't in the center and it's not a point charge. And so therefore, Coulomb's law does not apply. It's not that it's wrong, it's just that in this specific situation it doesn't apply. It only applies to point charges. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and look at Coulomb's law for charges at the same time. Okay, so this one is going to deal with three charges, all right, and then we'll put those together. So, let's look at example number three, three charges on a line, all right, so we've got a negative four microcoulomb charge, a positive three microcoulomb charge, and a negative seven. It gives us the distances between those charges, and it wants to, us to find the magnitude and direction of the net force on Q1. So I'm looking for the forces on this guy. Okay, so we know that the forces are going to be the electrostatic forces. So let's first find the electrostatic force of charge 2 on charge 1. Okay, I like to put a comma there because otherwise it looks like 21. But this is the force of object 2 on object 1. So K, Q1, Q2 over r squared, right? So 9 times 10 to the 9th times q1. So that's 3 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs, right? m is microcoulombs times negative 4 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. Now again, I'm just going to ignore the positives and negatives for now. And then divided by the radius, which was 0.2 squared. All right, so let's go ahead and find out what that gives us. So 9e to the 9th times 3e to the negative 6 times 4e to the negative 6th. And then we're going to divide that by 0.2 squared. And we get a force of 2.7 newtons. All right, so there we go, 2.7 newtons. Now what direction is that? OK, well, q2 was a negative. Q1 was a positive, which means attraction. So the force on Q1 is going to be pulling Q1 towards Q2. Okay, so 2.7 newtons left. All right, now let's find the force of charge 3 on charge 1. Okay, so again, K, which is 9 times 10 to the 9th, times Q1. So 3 times 10 to the negative 6th times Q2, the second charge this time is the 7 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. Okay, again, I'm ignoring the negative. I'll come back to the direction later. And this is micro, which is 10 to the negative 6. And then we're going to divide by the radius, which is 0.15 squared. So let's see what we get for that one. So 9e to the 9th times 3 e to the negative 6 times 7 e to the negative 6 divided by 0.15 squared and we get 8.4 so equals 8.4 newtons now which direction is this one well again it's a positive or negative so it's an attraction so what's going to happen to q1 remember we're still looking at q1 q1 is going to get pulled to the right so to right now the question is asking for the net force. So the net force is going to then be 
the sum of the two forces acting on it. Now this is a vector, right? These are vectors, which means we have to add them as vectors. So 2.7 to the left, and then 8.4 to the right is going to leave us with 8.4 minus 2.7, which is 5.7. So 5.7 newtons, it is a vector, so we have to name the direction. So that would be to the right. There you go, 5.7 newtons to the right. Cool, easy enough. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this one down. And uh, if you want to see the other two, the other two are a little bit more difficult. They start to put in components and directions. Remember, vectors have components, and you can't just add the numbers if they're going in different directions. So please take some time to watch the other one in just a little bit.